Hello, welcome to this podcast. I have chosen to do a deep dive into the PISA tests because from a comparative educational perspective, they have really shaped the world of education during the past 23 years. So what I wanted to dive into was what are the consequences of these tests? What have we learned from them? To answer these questions, I would have to ask why was the PISA tests introduced in the first place? What were the initial arguments? Can we see any improvement in educational systems over the years because of the PISA tests? If so, who does support this view? And who are on opposite sides arguing against it? Another perspective I also want to get into with this is how the PISA tests has shaped the national educational system of Norway. Because we started off the 2000s, had this concept of the PISA shock, that Norway did pretty much worse than other countries that we like to compare us with. This led to huge reforms, where we suddenly moved away from some of the ways of teaching and doing education that we had done for, for a while, into a more test-focused educational system. Now, the intention was really good. We wanted to improve our scores in the PISA tests. However, this makes the big question. Is the PISA tests really tests that we should strive towards? Or is there something fundamentally wrong about doing this kind of testing? Are there some perspective that we might miss? And are the methodologies of the PISA tests even good enough that they are actually worth something? Because how do you actually conduct these kinds of tests over multiple different educational systems, languages, and cultures without getting huge biases. No, before trying to answer any of the questions, we have to say something about what PISA tests are. The PISA tests are a program for international student assessments, and they're a series of international assessments conducted by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD. You probably heard about them. So these tests aim to evaluate and compare the knowledge and skills of 15-year-old students in reading, mathematics, and science. These tests are conducted every three years and are designed to assist students' ability to apply the knowledge and skills to real-life situations. At least that's what they're claiming. The aim is, of course, you want to learn from other educational systems so that you can inform your decisions, learn from each other. These are very nice ideals. So, at least in general, people don't critique the intentions. However, as you might have noticed, there are only three subjects tested. Reading, mathematics, and science. So what about the social sciences? Democracy education, arts and crafts. We don't have to do comparison on this. We, we can choose what we want to focus on, of course. However, as the world leading biggest study for comparing educational systems that is not isolated, but in a political system, well, that can definitely lead to some interest of conflicts and challenges when communicating the message and the value of these tests. I can definitely not list all of my findings and all of the discussions that I've read, but I will highlight some key figures and key perspectives before my own discussion or reflection on this topic. So first, we start with arguments for the PISA test. One of the front figures arguing for the PISA tests is Sir Michael Barber, the chief education advisor of Pearson. He says that the PISA tests has created a global benchmark for educational quality in education, and that it has stimulated healthy competition among countries and regions to improve their performance. No, what does he mean by this? Well, he uses Germany as an example. Before it was regarded as one of the leading educational systems in the world. However, this notion was more of a social construct. Maybe it was based somewhat on economic outputs and stuff like that, but there was really no fundamental testing that had been done to prove that this was true. As the Germans, they definitely experienced the piece of shock and pretty quickly 
because of all this attention, the educational system was re-evaluated. So this is one of his arguments for the PISA tests. He believes it has inspired a culture of evidence-based decision-making and innovation in education. And in this way, it has enabled educators and policymakers to learn or to figure out who has the best educational systems on different areas to learn the best practices based on the top performers. What you see is that some we Places like Finland, which did very well in the PISA tests, got a lot of attention and suddenly people started becoming interested in Finnish educational policies. That's something that would never have happened without the PISA tests. Another prominent figure that I've found, which are really influential in this question, is Andreas Schneider, the Director of Education and Skills at the OECD. Andreas Schneider is a well-spoken guy. You can find him doing TED Talks and other public speeches where he really highlights the historical context of educational systems and he analyzes the data in the PISA tests, looking at how economies have developed and improved over time, not only through economic measures, but also through the way they prioritize their spending within the school system. His strongest arguments is however based on the data showing that social equitable distribution, meaning how big is the gap between the well-performing students and the bottom performing students. It's shown that that room has shrinked, but in a positive direction. He also shows that the socioeconomic differences between students in countries have decreased as a result of the PISA studies. And this sounds really good if you can make the bottom part both getting smarter and more opportunities despite their social background. That's amazing. I have had a look at both his written public opinion papers. I've watched him in TED Talks and I looked at other sources to try to verify the data that he provides. And what I've found is that from a data point of you, it's hard for me to argue directly against what it tells. However, a lot of what you see also lies in the interpretation of this data because the PISA test comes with a lot of data and the way you interpret this data and count for other factors like global trends, economic growth or thinking about pedagogics in general also has to be taken into account. However, this bigger picture is not in his main focus. And this is where some of the critiques will come in and reevaluate the data later. For the critics of the PISA tests, we really have to understand some of the history of not only the PISA test, but also OSCD. Now, the OECD organization goes way back multiple decades and has been a central part in coming with advice to different educational systems in the world. Now, to learn about this, and especially in the Norwegian context, I used a book called PISA, Sannet um Skolen, or translated, The Truth About the School. Now, what this book highlights is that before PISA, there was already some recommendations and movements in policy trending towards centralization of the school system. And in 1988, the OSCD criticized some of the Norwegian reports on education by asking the question, how do you know that this is actually achieved when the Norwegian government came with claims. The early Norwegian reports shows that they believe that OSCD has some points, that more evidence-based testing should be done to increase the quality of education. But it also shows that there are some skepticism, not because of the tests themselves, but also because of the focus OSCD has like criteria and here is a central point in a lot of the critics it's about who sets the criteria, who sets the goals and their achievements of course something is directed by the topics that are chosen for comparison at the same time oscd also have some political agenda by themselves they want to increase trade through economic cooperation cross borders. In this way, you could argue that by only testing math, science and language, you will promote these kind of qualities to strengthen their political goal. This is very apparent when reading about different political parties here in Norway and their opinion on PISA, the socialist 
Here, the socialist left party are a huge critic of the PISA test because they believe that it's a too narrow focus on these kinds of tests. And they believe that this is very evident in the school politics and that this has actually led to a strength in the wrong direction of the school policy has given a completely wrong direction within the school politics. They also claim that this narrow focus on PISA tests have made it way easier for the right wing party to argue for testing in school in general, leading to more competition and more inequality rather than less. The Socialist Party here argues that the PISA tests has been the inspiration for the national tests, which we now do every year. And because this is a... And even though the test might have good intentions, eventually it ends up as a summative comparison tool to compare schools and countries when the results are eventually publicized. In other words, even if the PISA tests actually do what they claim to test people's ability to cope with new experiences new challenges. In the end, when it's translated into policy, it does more harm than good by shifting the focus from educational professionals to policymakers, just based on the size and popularity of these tests and the public media focus. And in response, the public's response to the tests and their demands. To the, at least, this is my summarized impression of that particular view from the left. Now, how deep does this discussion really go? Is it that significant as some politicians' claims, or is it pretty much insignificant? Well, here are some critiques. I think that is a territory which is pretty hard to navigate. So that was why I was glad when I came across a statistician that not only criticized the political implication, but also the methodology of the tests. No, the statisticians behind the statisticians are named Peter and Inge Henningsen, two Danish statisticians, and they come with some pretty harsh methodological critique towards the PISA statisticians. They actually just call it fantasizing and illusions and cheating in their new book, PISA Mathematics. No, what Peter is claiming is that the PISA tests do not have predictative validity, which means the power to use the results towards the future or in the context of development. It says it can't be used to predict anything about what children can and cannot do. And he says that's why you have to ask yourself why on earth they make this test. He asks if this is just a fairy tale. He actually shows that PISA has used something called imputation where when you don't have real statistics, you just create the statistics based on predictions which is a very serious discovery. He claims that the scores that PISA comes up with to a way too large extent is not for public debates and hidden behind walls and in this way does not reflect ethical productive research but just try to imitate it for political purposes. In the book they show that there is some more methodological problems where even experts has problems actually calculating the scores that are publicized. However, with or as with a lot of other very hard critique. This critique is potentially too far off in the conservative, in the super critical direction. Researchers from the University of Oslo goes through the Danish statisticians' claims and they highlight other tests, more long-term studies from for example, Canada, to show that the PSAP tests and the results from them can actually be at least partly verified long-term follow-up studies when you look at things like the kind of education and job possibilities they get later in life. They also highlight that population estimates have to be done with this generalizing concept to fully reflect the whole population. So they don't see the same methodological problems and challenges as the Danish researchers. Actually, when reading through all of these articles, segments of different books, watching very smart people highlight benefits and the downsides, I've experienced that I've become more informed. But not only this specific discussion about how we should do 
comparisons in international education. But I've also learned to be more, to become more skeptical to all kind of claims. Because a lot of these claims have some form of pathos in them. They argue not only based on very clear-cut, understandable mathematics or methods, but they also try to shape your opinion based on their own values by highlighting their findings and what they find important. Important. There is so much more to be discussed on this topic. However, I have to round up and try to explain why I've highlighted the specific. The reason why I highlighted this particular discussion is because it shows that peace is way more complex. The reasons for and against than I initially than I initially thought. Personally, I definitely lead. Personally, I definitely lean towards the section of people that believe the PISA tests should be faded out, that they should not have the same status and focus as it has today. Reading through this, doing this research, I've definitely figured out that some of my initial arguments were 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 wrong. I believed that the PISA tests was much more of a specific memorization tests that you could really prepare towards. No, I think definitely that school system can be shaped to try to perform better on PISA tests, which is very unfortunate. That's perhaps one of my greatest critique, that this narrow focus on only three subjects. However, it's hard to deny that it seems that educational discussion in general has been increased in the public sphere. And even funding of schools has increased after the PISA tests. And even though spending can be done in a lot of different ways and reach different results, based on where the money goes or flows. I think a strengthening of the educational sector in general is very positive for the field of education. If not either a direct correlation, probably to some extent there will be a correlation. Now another critique that I have myself that I have not really figured or seen any direct critique of is the, if there is a correlation between the increased pressures in school and the PISA results. Because something we know is that students are more and more pressured in their daily life in, in school. I guess some part of this is social media, but really testing and the strong focus on testing has probably made the situation worse. And some statistics I would really have liked to find was to what degree other subjects are downplayed due to the PISA results. Now I know that arts and crafts have been downplayed the 23 past year. You see it especially after school reforms where before first graders had a lot of play in their classroom. But now 23 years later after the PISA test started it's suddenly catastrophic if a first grader can't read. And I'm afraid that this way of thinking perhaps comes from this testing. You don't want to do bad in this testing as a country, a nation. And therefore you start to get afraid to do playful activities or crafts activities. Now I've read someone actually thought that PISA tests was somewhat of an IQ test. And if you think about IQ testing, then there is actually an argument that the more different areas of knowledge you have, the better you will perform in IQ tests because you will have a higher general intellect, making it easier for you to draw associations from different fields and to connect new information to existing information. You can think of Vygotsky's theory of constructing knowledge, constructing knowledge in schemes. So if you have some knowledge, you can attach new knowledge easier. And with a very narrow focus on just some part of knowledge, then you will get less associations, which in turn should result in a lower general intelligence. So that was just some ending thoughts to why I probably believe that, yeah, it's not very convenient to have this massive test dictating and informing educational policies because you will, in the end, be more focused about how to increase that kind of, because you will perhaps get a more in-depth knowledge with the cost that you reduce the width of the knowledge. Okay.